I'm going to spend the next few weeks talking to you about how you can grow spiritually. And I, and I want this to be uh, like really practical and challenging and have something for you to get out of it. Uh, for the, really at the beginning of this, what I want to do is help you to understand how much the Holy Spirit is, is working with you in this. Because sometimes when you are, are going through your, your spiritual life uh, and you have all the things that you know you're supposed to do, right? Like you're supposed to come to church, you're supposed to read your Bible, you're supposed to pray, you're supposed to be a part of a small group, you're supposed to, supposed to, supposed to, supposed to, supposed to, supposed to. <sighs> Sometimes that feels great, doesn't it? Sometimes it feels like a lot of work and it feels like work. And, uh, you know, there, there is any good thing that you do in life you put effort into. Uh, I imagine there is nothing that you've done in your life that's been really significant that you haven't put some good effort into, right? That's just sort of how life works. But I think one of the big lies of the enemy in our life is that, is that this whole thing is really about our effort and our work and what we do and what we're putting into this, where there is a whole nother way that I hope that you get this morning that uh, God is, is partnering with you. The Holy Spirit is at work in your life and is, wants to bring together in you this sense of what I'm going to call that... Um, Rather than it being something that you are doing, here, here's what, and you saw the title, here's what I want you to think. All of your like, fancy words like spiritual formation and spiritual life comes down to this. You get to enjoy God. Isn't that so? Yes, that, that would be your cue. Doesn't that sound way better? Look at that. Who would not want to do that? Right? And, and I think... You know, so you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound like, you know, because when I went to Bible, when I went to seminary, I read books like that thick about all this stuff. And by the time I was done, I wasn't enjoying God. I just enjoyed laying down because I wanted to make it happen. But I, I think as you look in the Bible and as you understand, like right from the beginning, God created Adam and Eve because he was tired and he needed somebody to name the animals. Of course not. Why did God create Adam and Eve? He created them to have a relationship so he could walk in the cool of the evening with them. Hey, does that sound a little bit like God wanted to enjoy Adam and Eve? Right? And I think we've made this into something that it never was intended to be. Jesus said when he, had his, he brought his followers together and kind of at the very end of the whole thing, he said, you know what? We're not gonna, I'm not going to call you servants because servants doesn't fit who you really are. Instead, I'm going to call you friends. Huh. What are you supposed to do with your friends? Insult them? At, no, no, <laughs> that's like a guy thing. <laughs> You know what you're supposed to do with your friends? Enjoy them, right? And, and when you go, out and I had somebody to come over. This is, I thought this was kind of funny. Somebody come over to my place, and we, were, we didn't really know each other that well. We were talking, and everything. He says, hey, this is sort of interesting. I'm actually enjoying myself. <laughs> I thought, okay. <laughs> You know, because sometimes this, we, we confuse this whole thing that it's some sort of spiritual obligation that we have, that now I have to do this. I have to. How about if we accept the invitation from the Holy Spirit to say, I want you to come. I want you to come. Because, and you're answering God's call, right? You're, you're not... You're answering God's call to say, hey, would you come and let me enjoy you as you enjoy me? You know that God enjoys you? And not when you're all nice and spiritual and looking good. At, well, some of us look good in church, but not, not when you're doing your best stuff. But when God is always at the place because Jesus died and he took, all, he took care of all that stuff where he says, hey, you know what I want to do? I just want to enjoy you. I want to enjoy you. 
And, and not just when you're doing like Sunday morning, I want to enjoy you every day. Because I think what happens in our life sometimes is we have, we have like Pastor Mark preaches a great message. There's incredible worship. You go into the, the foyer and you meet people and you're encouraged and you could do your thing and you have a great time on Sunday. And by Monday, it's all kind of leaked out. <laughs> and you go, I need to... I need to bottle that somehow. I need to recreate that experience maybe. Maybe I could recreate that experience and happen. But that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to get to the place in our life where there is that constant everyday enjoyment of him because he's enjoying you. And, and I, I, think, I think for most of us, if we're honest... If I would say, do you know how much God absolutely enjoys you? Most of you would give it a, a, like a four. On your bad days, what would you give it? Is there a negative to this scale? <laughs> right? Do you really believe that God enjoys you? I, I, I think... I think this is one of the classic lies of the enemy in our life, folks, is that we don't understand that God said, hey, you know what? I actually created you. I called you my friend. And now what I want to do is I want to build us into this place where you and I are enjoying each other. Let's read Psalm 131. It's going to be coming up on the screen. It says, oh, Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord this time forth and forevermore. Paul. David is getting us to understand something that uh, is incredibly important. So here's what I want to do. Holy Spirit, would you come, and over this time that we have together, would you, would you give each of us one thing that we can grab a hold of and that we can put into our soul that allows us to understand that you truly enjoy us and that we are actually called just simply to enjoy you. We invite you, Holy Spirit. We've been in this place of worship. We're uh, going to be receiving something now. And we ask you to come and give us that one thing. Thank you, Lord. All right. I'm, I'm gonna, I gave you a little teaser of this when I preached before. But I, I'm going to give you kind of a framework for how you do all these things in your life, how you include them in your absolute every day. And there's ways, this is basically how you grow. There's ways to live your life that you're going to see um, uh, coming up on the screen. And, and the first, there are basically three levels of this. The first level is the passive level. And uh, if you're going to enjoy God, you, you can kind of live on the bottom. I've called it the Forrest Gump version, right? You can kind of live on the bottom where it's, you know, life is like a box of chocolates. You just never know what you're going to get. And sometimes, if we're honest, we live there, right? We just say, well, I'm going to get the kids off to their stuff, and I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to do work, and I'm going to hopefully find some time to just decompress and, you know, read through some mindless Reddit stuff or whatever and make it happen. And we live in that passive state. And, and that, you know, you, if you live your life there, does God still love you? Yes, you probably aren't going to be getting the same level of enjoyment out of him if you live your life there, right? It's, and, and really, that's what it's all about. The, the second place is, is the active place, is actually more of where we're at. And, and uh, there are, are sort of three levels of things, and I'm going to be talking more about this in detail later. But there's revelation, there's truth that you can get in your life that, that God just absolutely brings you to where you're reading the Bible, you're praying, you're in quietness, you're being generous, you're serving, all those things. There's relationships that you have around him. And then there's, there's those, those kind of natural rhythms that you want to get in your life where it isn't like you just 
occasionally go to church. Sunday morning is a church thing or Saturday. You, you have your time with God and you keep that rhythm going in your life. And basically what you want to do is have those rhythms keep going and going and going until they become just a natural part of your outflow. This is what I do. And the more you get into the rhythm, the more you enjoy God. Because those things are, are, are very significant. And, and I, I think as, as I looked at those things, there, there, was, there was probably um, a way that we have to be intentional that, that has to do with, with smallness. Most of those things that we do are really, are really small. And they're kind of unintentional almost where you would think of it, but it's things that you do in your life every day that nobody sees that they're hidden. That really is the thing that helps you enjoy God more. I I was in somebody's bathroom and I I saw this picture and, and it says, you know, everybody wants to be a changer, right? Everybody wants to be a world changer, uh, but nobody wants to change the toilet paper. Be the change. That's a lot like, that's a lot like how this works. So I had to take a picture in their bathroom. I thought that was kind of fun. It's, it's those small things that we do. It's a long obedience in the same direction that we put those rhythms into our life. Now, the third, the third level, and this is important, is that exceptional level. I call it kind of the aha And you have times in your life where you have these amazing experiences, right? Maybe you're doing your devotions and something just pops for you and you get it and you have those times you get it. Maybe you got prophesied over and it was absolutely amazing. It's some sort of mountaintop experience that you have where you just kind of go boom. And sometimes that's even a little bit of a season. You ever had those times where like for a week or so, it's all just happening and going and flowing and you're going like, Woo! yes, <laughs> I got this now. This is going to be the rest of my life. No, <laughs> you know, it's not, you weren't actually created to live on the mountain. You were created to do and live those things, those every day rhythms that you have in your life. And what, you know what the mountaintop things are for? They're for lifting your eyes up so you can see what God actually has for you. But every, the everyday life is where you live it. Does that make sense? That's the place where you want to be. Um, there's um, a meme that I came across and, and I, I think this sort of represents some of those things that we can look at. It says, in 2019, I thought, if I could just have a week with nowhere to go and nothing to do, I'd get my house in order. 2021? Nope. (laughs) That wasn't the problem, was it? (laughs) And the reason why that's a little bit funny is because we kind of believe that. We kind of believe that if I just had more time, right? Isn't this how this works? If I wasn't so busy, my husband wasn't so demanding, right? If I didn't have that to-do list that that I'm supposed to get to, that I never get to any because I'm laying down and hoping it goes away, that if any of those things would happen, I would be able to do this. Guess what? That is not the problem, is it? Because probably none of you were more spiritual during the pandemic than you are necessarily now. Amen? Yeah. You know why? Because that's not the problem. What we need to do is begin to understand that there's a rhythm that the Holy Spirit is putting in our lives. And he's calling us to it. And he is really saying to us, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to understand that God enjoys you. And would you come and begin to enjoy me? in a way that's significant. Okay, so we're going to jump into our, our text. And that's Psalm 63. And I want to read it together with you. And there's a few words that I'm going to emphasize that I'd like you to say after me, okay? Oh God, you are my God. Say my God. 
earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David is, is writing this psalm when he is out in the desert, probably when he's escaped from Saul. And so he gets the no water thing. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. Behold your glory and your power because your steadfast love is better than life. Let's say it together. Love is better than life. Hmm. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as, my, as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. So I want to talk to you about one thing just to kind of introduce this topic, and that's this. Do you like to hang out with God? Some days the answer to that is yes. yes. Other days you have no idea because you're too busy and you're ignoring him, right? You thought, oh man, it's 10 o'clock. I should have my devotions. And you're out. And what, what David puts together for us here is a, a little pattern to help you say, you know what, I want to fan into flame your desire for me. I, I want to help you to really get that what you want deep inside, I want to help fan that into flame in your life. I want your desire level to raise. Because if you have no desire for God, this is just going to be a grind. And what, and what David is saying is, let me, let me ignite that in your life. I want to ignite that sense of God is real and who he is in my life. So here's, here's a few things, and then we're going to do something together that I hope is going to be really helpful. Uh, there, the, in the beginning of this passage, it says, oh God, you are my God. Who are the people that you can say are your people? I have my wife and my sons, right, and my friends. What, what's, what are those things? Those are that close, intimate, personal connection, right? It's my, oh God, you are my God. It's close, it's real, it's personal. If you are going to have that fire for this, you're going to be ignited in this, it's going to be fanned into flame. It isn't sort of a general thing, it's specific. It's God, you are my God, and, and did you notice that he says, you're my God, so he's starting it all off. There's a relationship. And then he says, I'm going to seek you. And I, I think, folks, this might be the most important thing, and that's this. Is that God is actually wooing you all the time. He's actually... And, and I, I'm not going to use the word seduce because that would seem negative. That could seem negative. <laughs> but what he is, is he's drawing you in. He's always in the place where he's saying, come on, I want to spend time with you. I want to enjoy you. I want to be in that place where we walk together and we do things together and you get who I am and you study me. And, and you've done this where you're studying the Bible and all of a sudden something just absolutely pops out of it. And you go, oh, Wow, God, that's who you are. And God is continually in this process of wooing you. How different is that than saying, I have to read the Bible? Right? God, I want to enjoy you. I want to, have, I want to be close to you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> I, I want to lay my head on your shoulder. And I want to be in your presence. I want to paint a picture for you today that you get something so different than the I have to's. That you get something that's so close. And, and literally what David is describing in this passage is a sense of, I, I want to connect with you in a way that's so intimate, that's so close, that's so personal. I want you and me to be in that place where we just can be in each other's presence and enjoy. Um, Eileen and I drove to Branson, Missouri uh, over last in, G in June. And it was probably about 16 hours of driving. And uh, she said, <laughs> too much information probably. She said to me, well, I'm, wi I'm really excited about, I told you this before, I'm really excited about our deep talks that we're going to have. And at that point, what happened? 
I was hoping just to drive. Now we need to be deep. I don't know how deep I really am. <laughs> like, let's face it. <laughs> Men, amen? Amen? Ladies, sorry. We're just not that deep, right? This is the answer to that question. And, and, and as we're going on and, and driving, we got into these amazing talks. And because I'm kind of an idiot, I said, so, are we deep now? How many think that was helpful? <laughs> Not so helpful. And so we're, we're going, we're having these conversations. And you know what? We, we decided that we weren't going to fly because we could have flown there. Uh, I mean, there's some other stuff going on. But um, we, we spent 16 hours, probably more than that with stops and everything. And we realized that there was something just as sweet being together and just being with each other when there, as there was when we were talking and really getting into things and sharing what was significant to us, there is an enjoyment that you can have. So what do you enjoy about God? I, I, I want you to think about that. What, what is it that you really enjoy about him? Is it the quiet? Is it that no matter how horrible you are, that he always has an open door? What do you truly value about your relationship with God? Do you know that that's the place that he's been wooing you in? That's the place that he's been, been saying, hey, come on, be with me, lay my head on your head on my shoulder dance together, do whatever it is that you want to do. I am wooing you. I want to be with you. I think it, and, and even if the change isn't immediate, I think what happens when we begin to see that is we begin to understand what David says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my, fe my flesh uh, faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Because it's not some general God that you're, you're talking to, it's actually that God, the one who is close to you, the one who you want to experience. And, and as you do this, I, there are three things that I want to take just a minute to, to talk to you about. And, and how do you, if God is wooing you, and if he really wants you to experience it, how do you build your appetite for him? And there are three things really, really quickly. You're going to see them coming up on the screen. First thing is this, is don't ruin your appetite with empty calories. Second thing is focus on consuming the best stuff. And the third thing is give thanks for more than just before you eat. And I'm going to go through these really quickly. But as we do this, don't ruin your appetite. Uh, your, your cookie jar is really tempting before the meal, right? And, and, if I, and I'm really trying to get like personal and down with you. What are the cookies in your life? Um, the big categories are money, sex, and power. Uh, but what are your cookies? All of us have cookies, right? And I'm not talking about the computer thing that you accept. The, <laughs> those things in your life that you know are the empty calories, that you know that if I fill myself up with this, I'm probably not gonna get the deep and the depth. I'm probably not gonna even know that God's wooing me. I'm probably not even gonna sense his presence because I filled myself up so much with the cookies. What are your cookies? You know what? Um, I, and I'm not gonna spend some time naming them. I had prayed and that prayer was sincere, folks that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you what it is in your life. What are those things that are, you're just doing that you know fill yourself up so when it comes to the real stuff, you're empty? What is it in your life? Take a minute and, and just ask the Lord that. Holy Spirit, would you show us? Nothing wrong with talking about the bombers and the jets and cars. But there's something else that God wants to fill you with. We don't want to ruin our appetites with empty calories. Secondly, we want to focus on consuming the good stuff. Who he is, his power, his love, his glory. 
uh, in I, I have saw this absolutely interesting thing is that, is that I think is really important to us is God wants to change how you believe about yourself and about who he is. And belief is an interesting thing. Um, it isn't just Christian. Belief is this, is that I choose to receive some things and I choose to reject some things that I just believe. Because you're a Christian, you are naturally predisposed. Okay, I want you to work with me. You're naturally predisposed to just believe some things about God and some other things just fall away because you don't believe them. And uh, I, I, I was watching this. Okay, don't judge me. I was watching a clip of The View. Take, take a look up here. And, and I don't know if you know the guy in the middle. Like, there's all these women up there who are mostly on, let's say, one part of the political spectrum. And then there's the guy in the middle who is Ted Cruz, who is, let me get over here. He'd be like way over here, right? And I was listening to this, I'm thinking, first of all, hey, good on you, dude, that you would do that. Because that looks like a dangerous situation to me. <laughs> right? <laughs> you are about to be eaten <laughs> by the cougars. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> that was bad. Uh, and, and as I was listening to them, and, you, and the, the lady on the left is Whoopi Goldberg and, and Ted Cruz, and they were having this conversation. And you know what was interesting to me? Both of them believed that there were two different elections in the US and both of them believed that they were stolen. Both of them believed exactly the same thing. That uh, Whoopi believed that Hillary Clinton's election was stolen and it's these machines weren't working. And Ted Cruz believed that Donald Trump's election was stolen and these machines weren't working. And guess what? It didn't matter what anybody said about anything. It was stolen! <laughs> I just thought, that is absolutely fascinating. You guys believe exactly the same thing, and you look at the other person, you say you're completely wrong. You believe the same stuff. And this is what happens in our life. If we just stay within ourself, we just end up believing all the same stuff. And the enemy has total access to your mind, your hearts, your thought. And you, all you do is you just reiterate the same thing. It's why you need to have the fullness of God come in. You need to have what is true about the Father, what's true about the Son, what's true about the Holy Spirit. Belief has to be fed from the outside and has to be received. I was reading this study that was a little bit terrifying <clears throat> where it said that you, know, you would think that smarter people how many of you think you're, no, never mind. We all do, right? We all think we're a little bit smart. That smarter people are actually more susceptible to this phenomena of saying, well, I what I believe is right, and will let truth, even that is good, fall away because they've already decided what they know is right. And you know what the enemy does? He totally takes advantage of this. I'm a smart person, I know what's right, and your belief gets reinforced over and over, and some of those things that you're believing in your heart are completely not true about yourself and about God. Because sometimes things have happened in your life that are really hard, and you begin to believe that God isn't really good. Or, or maybe God's good for the guy who stands behind the pulpit, but the 10 things that have broken in my house and Revenue Canada calls and says, oh, by the way, and all those other things begin to happen and all of a sudden those things that you thought were true actually begin to get crunched inside of you. And this is why empty calories, real trouble. Well, you need to fill up with the sense of the fullness of who God is. And the last part, the last thing I want to encourage you in is this. And this is kind of our superpower, and that's being grateful. Give thanks for more than just before you eat. I'd like you to do something for me. Would you close your eyes? I'm going to read some thankfulness thoughts that I believe God wants to let pour over you. 
because they're things that are true for each one of us as his children. Thank you, Lord, that in every good thing we can enjoy our Father's generosity. Thank you, Lord, that in every hardship we can enjoy our Father's formation, that you're building us. Thank you, Lord, that in every prayer, every prayer, we can enjoy our Father's welcome. Thank you, Lord, that in every failure, we can enjoy your grace. And all the guilt is gone. Thank you, Lord, that in every pain, we can enjoy Jesus' presence. Thank you, Lord, that in every temptation, we can enjoy the Spirit's life. The temptation is really just an opportunity for victory. Thank you, God, that in every groan that we have in this world, that we can enjoy the Spirit's hope. That as Christians, we don't look back, we can look forward. And even as we groan, we look forward to something so much better. I thank you, Lord, in every word that you speak to us. We can enjoy the Spirit's voice. You enjoy us. I thank you that we can enjoy you. Amen.